Today, we continue our sermon series titled Strangers in Strange Lands. The people of Israel have gone from slaves in Egypt to wanderers in the wilderness. They've been newcomers to the land of Canaan and carved out their place as a unified nation. They've been divided and conquered, and now they find themselves as strangers in strange lands as they're captured and exiled to foreign lands. Last week, Lindsay preached from the book of Esther. Esther was a Jewish girl living in exile in Persia. She eventually becomes queen and saves her people from genocide. The story of Esther is incredible. It's a story that features a powerful woman with lots of twists and turns. It's also an interesting example that shows the stories from Scripture can get a little tricky because of the way that the books are collected. You see, the Bible isn't just one book. No, it's 66 different books all put together. It's a whole library of books, if you will. Great councils of the church in the past, from as early as the first century, gathered and voted to approve certain books that would come to comprise what we know as the Bible, the books of the Old and the New Testament. These books were considered canon, which means an approved list of books, as well as an approved books in a list, all at the same time. Once the Bible became canon, the books were placed in a particular order. And so in our Western minds, we tend to think that the books are listed chronologically, starting with Genesis moving forward. However, the Hebrew Bible, sometimes called the Old Testament, is actually arranged in layers. The historical books layer on top of each other. The prophets layer on top of the historical books. Wisdom literature like Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes were collected during these periods of history. The prophets add yet another layer to canon as their prophetic voices don't come to us in some sort of a vacuum. They're always very much contextual. So what does that matter? Well, first, I think it's important to be reminded of what the scriptures are and where they come from. We believe that the scriptures of the Old and New Testament were inspired by the Holy Spirit, are still inspired by the Holy Spirit, and carry authority for how we live out our faith today. And we have a responsibility to realize where they come from, their context, their meaning to the original audience. Only then can we truly glean their wisdom for our lives today. Today, we continue our journey through the scriptures and arrive at the book of Nehemiah. At this point in history, the people of Israel have been in exile for about 60 years. Nehemiah is an interesting story about an Israelite who happens to become an official in the Persian courts. He asks the king for permission to return to his homeland and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And the king says yes. Not only does the king say yes, but gives him incredible amounts of resources to aid in the project. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are separate in our English Bibles, but they're actually one volume written by a single author. The story focuses on three leaders who share similarities. Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Now, Zerubbabel means planted in Babylon. With permission from King Cyrus of Persia, Zerubbabel leads a group of people back to Jerusalem. The altar of the Lord is rebuilt, as is the temple. Woohoo, right? I mean, God's promises are being kept. There's hope, but it's not all great. God's promises, uh, uh, rather, God's presence doesn't fill the temple like it did before. It's not as glorious as Solomon's temple, and some who are around are disappointed, and they begin to rise up in opposition. Now, Ezra is a priest who wants to bring about spiritual renewal. Ezra is granted permission from Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, to lead his people back. Likewise, Nehemiah is an official in the Persian courts, and he hears news of the sad state of Jerusalem. And so he petitions the king and gets permission, along with resources and even armed guards, to go and rebuild the city. Ezra and Nehemiah return to the city around about the same time and begin to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, both spiritually and physically. However, both of them face opposition both from enemies of Israel and from within, from the people who were not exiled and remained in the city. Nehemiah's specific focus was on rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Now that sounds hopeful, right? I mean, refortifying the city walls would mean a return to safety and security, not to mention a boost of morale and esteem for their ancestral home. However, according to the prophet Zechariah, a contemporary of Ezra and Nehemiah, the new Jerusalem is supposed to be a kingdom without walls. 
where the presence of God was unbound and free in the city, a beacon of hope for the world. Nehemiah building a wall doesn't really seem to be alongside that vision, does it? It's almost an unintentional affront to this image of a new Jerusalem. As Nehemiah begins to rebuild the walls, he faces opposition from enemies, foreign and domestic. Let's take a look at his story from Nehemiah chapter 4. Now when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged and he mocked the Jews. He said in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish, burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, that stone wall that they're building, any fox going up on it would break it down. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their taunt back on their own heads and give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt and do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have raged against the builders. So we rebuilt the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the walls of Jerusalem was going forward and the gaps were beginning to be closed, they were very angry and all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. So we, played, we prayed rather to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. But Judah said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing and there is too much rubbish so that we are unable to work on the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see anything before we come upon them and kill them and stop the work. When the Jews who lived near them came, they said to us ten times, from all the places where they live, they will come up against us. So, in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people according to their families, with their swords, their spears, and their bows. After I looked these things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your kin, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your households. Pretty interesting stuff, huh? Well, the first thing we meet is members of the opposition. Sanballat was a Samaritan, an Assyrian official who rises against Nehemiah. Now, here's the thing. If you're a fan of sarcasm, then you might be a fan of Sanballat's questioning here in chapter 4. They are loaded with sarcasm. Sanballat asked five super sarcastic questions of Nehemiah and the people of Israel. The first one, what are these feeble Jews doing? This word feeble has connotations of impotence. He's, he's suggesting that they don't have the strength required to accomplish their goal. Second, he says, will they restore it themselves? The translation of restore here might be better suited as abandon. In other words, will they leave everything to God? As in, it's going to take a miracle to put this thing back together. And thirdly, he asks, will they offer sacrifice? Sanballat mocks the community's dependence on God and their liturgical practices. It's almost like he's saying, are they going to make sacrifices to make this wall happen? Fourthly, he says, will they finish it in a day? Sanballat again makes fun of the Jews for thinking they can finish the work in record time. And lastly, he says, will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish? Burns one, burned ones at that. Sanballat, see, he, he discredits the building materials and the workmanship of the people. The question, in other words, asks, do they think they can bring to life stones from a ruined wall so that the wall will build itself somehow? Nehemiah's response to these verbal threats is also only verbal. He offers a prayer. Their verbal threats were psychological warfare, but his prayer is difficult to read too because it's so visceral. I mean, Nehemiah asked God not 
to forgive them. Essentially, Nehemiah concludes that any enemy of his project is an enemy of God. Now, that's more than slightly alarming, right? But before tossing Nehemiah's prayer too quickly to the side, there are times when hostility is directed not only against us as people, but against us as God's people. It's designed to thwart God's purposes. While it's becoming increasingly unpopular in our day and age, the biblical accounts are clear that God's people always face opposition, both embodied and spiritual. Now, the whole wall had been joined together up to half of its expected height. And Nehemiah notes that all the people have worked on the wall with all of their heart. The people had a mind to work, he says. You know, it's amazing what people can accomplish when they put their minds to it. It's almost miraculous what people can accomplish when their heart is in the work, isn't it? Sanballat and his friend Tobias are, are none too happy with the people's efforts or the way that they've worked together. They're described as exceedingly angry over the news of the walls being repaired. And so they join together to, to fight against Jerusalem by creating social disorder and havoc. Their verbal threats are now mobilized for violence. And then we hear from Judah, which who, his words seem weird in verse 10. He says, The strength of the burden bearers is failing and there is too much rubbish so that we are unable to work on the wall. In Hebrew, this seems to be a song or a poem. You see, burden bearers and we are unable rhyme in the Hebrew language. And so this little poem suggests that people were tired of carrying rocks and rubble and the remaining task just seemed overwhelming. They felt incapable of completing the wall. Judah is adding to the noise by singing his song. His, his complaining isn't just annoying, it's demoralizing. So Nehemiah's story demonstrates that a community is often threatened as much by internal weakness like Judah as by external attack. In fact, our enemies often have very little power if we individually and collectively retain our integrity. In the face of opposition, old Nehemiah has a plan. The scriptures describe a mixture of physical and spiritual uh, in carrying out one's calling. Nehemiah responded to the first threat with prayer. But to the second, he responded with prayer and setting up a guard. You see, conditions changed, and Nehemiah did not make the mistake of only praying while neglecting to take concrete actions through which God could provide deliverance. It's like one of my friends who served in the Navy would often say, he said, we must pray to heaven and also row towards the shore. The story of Nehemiah and his building project is, is often touted by leadership books and it's really popular in men's Bible studies in particular. However, the story of Nehemiah is not exactly a success story. Later on in the book, Nehemiah discovers that even though the walls and the temple have been rebuilt, the people remain in disrepair. The temple is neglected and staffed by unqualified people. The Sabbath is continually not kept. Marketplaces fill the temple and areas close to the newly rebuilt walls. The high hopes of Messiah, the rebuilding of the temple, the spiritual renewal, the, those hopes are all dashed. The spiritual and social renewal efforts simply didn't work. They, they fixed the outside issues, but they failed to reach the hearts of the people. And so later on in the book, Nehemiah actually ends up going a little crazy. He, he's seen yelling at people, literally ripping out their hair, turning over tables in the temple. Yikes. Still, Ezra and Nehemiah teach us a valuable lesson here, I think. What matters is the heart. The temple being rebuilt, the, the beautification of the city, the protection of the wall, all good stuff, even great. But the people remain indifferent. They remain unchanged. And I think, friends, that, that you and I might be more similar than we might hope to these ancient ancestors. I think we do face opposition in our lives of faith, opposition from a culture of slippery slopes and individualism and opposition from our own selfish desires as well. We have amazing opportunities living in this incredible place. We have beautiful sanctuaries and churches all throughout our area set apart for the worship of God. We have freedoms to use our resources and spend our time keeping God's commands. 
Yet how many of us remain indifferent and unchanged? How many of us live lives that are no different than those of our non-believing neighbors? How many of us have neglected the Sabbath and we fail to keep it holy? How many of us are content to live our own lives in our own ways on our own terms? How many? Lots. Friends, it is amazing what we can accomplish when our heart is in the right place. I believe, friends, when we, the church, the body of Christ, when we get this right, when our priorities are straight, when we live our lives in grateful response for what God has done and live as disciples of Jesus Christ and when we care for one another, just imagine what the church can accomplish. We can change the world. But when we, the body of Christ, the church, when we get this wrong, when our hearts remain indifferent and unchanged, when we focus on our own selfish ambitions and desires and preferences and opinions, when we get overwhelmed by the work yet to do, when we do these things, we get it wrong and we hurt one another and we damage the rep reputation of who we are as the people of God. And so my prayer for you and for me is that in the midst of all the good things that we have in our lives, the things that are beautiful and being rebuilt, my prayer is that our hearts might be the things that are changed, that we might commit ourselves to keeping God's commandments, that we might commit ourselves to being disciplined in our walk with Jesus, and that we might be united together and with our whole heart long to do the work of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. This is my prayer for you and my prayer for me, and I ask it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.